Thank you, Corey. Um, welcome everybody to the session. Um, as Corey said, this is absolutely fantastic to be able to host this global conversation exploring our creative industry and how it's proactively managing the return to the office um, in all different parts of the world. Um, at Cowshed, if you can see here, uh, we're going through the return to office right now. And I think it's safe to say that coming back in is uh, a hell of a lot harder than it was just asking everybody to pack up and work from home. Um, and as creatives, the very nature of our work is really interactive and empathetic. And, you know, we, there is a certain need for human interaction. But things have really shifted. And so what does that mean now? How do we use our shared spaces and how are we going to adapt? Um, so to take us through some of those challenges, um, we've brought together three amazing leaders to talk through their specific circumstances um, and offer us advice. So just a little bit about those women. Um, Kiri founded Sinclair in 2009 and is responsible for the agency's regional growth and team first culture. Uh, Sinclair has offices in Singapore, Beijing, Hong Kong and Shanghai and she's certainly got a fantastically interesting story to tell. Um, Kiri serves on the board of PR Hong Kong and the Marketing Society and is a member of the PRCA Global Ethics Council. Following Kiri, we'll speak with Sarah Jenkins. She's Managing Director of Saatchi in Saatchi London, advertising, so not strictly PR, uh, comms uh, and creative industries. So Sarah joined Saatchi in December 2019. I think it's fair to say she's literally spent more time at home at Saatchi than she has in the office. Um, so I'm sure she knows exactly how to work from home. Um, Sarah was previously marketing officer, chief marketing officer at Grey, responsible for flagship creative accounts, including British Heart Foundation and Lucas Aid. And one fun fact about Sarah, which is not on her biog, is that she started her career uh, at Fox Parrot Fox, an integrated agency at the heart of everything and very much ahead of its time, which is where I met her in 1997. Um, aged us, Vicky. <laughs> <laughs> Damn you. I don't think we went to university, we just left school. <laughs> Um, Jennifer is the Director of Corporate Communications for Armstrong World Industries. It's a 160 year old billion dollar public company which is headquartered in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, Jennifer leads internal and external comms including employee, customer and community communications as well as all the media relations and crisis management. She's also president of their philanthropic philanthropic arm, the Armstrong World Industries Foundation. So we're going to get a really global view. Um, the chat function is open. Please send your questions in and we'll go through them through the session or at the end or both. We'll see how that goes. Um, but as the expression goes, it's always gin o'clock somewhere. And that place right now is Hong Kong. So we're going to start with Kiri and the Asia perspective. Kiri, over to you. Vicky, thank you so much, and to PRCA for organizing these uh, task forces. Um, I find them very helpful, so I appreciate that, and fantastic to be here with Sarah and Jennifer. And as Vicky said, good evening, everyone. Um, sorry about the lighting. I can't seem to fix it today. It's having its own world. And a second apology in advance in case a cat joins us today. They are locked in the back room, but they um, have minds of their own and have joined a few webinars previously. So. Apologies in advance for that. So I'm sitting currently in Hong Kong. And so in the market here, we have 2,132 cases as of today, remembering that our population is 8 million. Uh, and we've had 14 deaths. And in fact, today is the highest COVID case count we have had in one given day since this began, which for us was in, in January 20. 20, is it still 2020? Yeah, um, yeah sorry. Um, yeah, and so today, actually, we are now in the midst of the worst uh, community outbreak that we have had here in the Hong Kong market. I also oversee offices that are in Singapore, um, and as you've probably read through, um, through the media there, they've had uh, quite a massive outbreak that is now contained and under control, and Singapore are back to the office and its work almost as usual, their circuit breaker, uh, which is their um, stay-at-home policies, have, have finished. And in Shanghai and Beijing, where we also have offices, our teams have been up and working since 
uh, April, I think beginning of May, and China is full force ahead apart from some um, jurisdictions where the markets are closed down because of a, a small community outbreak. But coming back to how have we managed this period of time, I just first of all wanted to kind of put you in a position of where we are in our market, which is it's month six. I'm amazed I still have hair because I keep pulling it out. Um, and the first inclination that we had that there was a problem came as a pop-up, as a, one of those breaking news alerts. And it was the 31st of December last year. And it said on my breaking news that there was a suspected outbreak of SARS in the, the mainland market. And from that point onwards, Hong Kong started preparing. So the thing to remember about the greater China and APAC region is that we have done this before. And that actually, although 17 years ago, puts a very different perspective on how seriously we took it and how we responded. So after SARS, um, there became a very common uh, habit of people that if they were sick, they would wear a mask. So on a given day, if someone had a bit of a sniffly nose or a cough, they would wear a mask when in the office, in the MTR, which is our, you know, our mass transit, um, or around other people. And so it's a very common and comfortable thing for us to be doing. So once this came around, actually by mid-January, we started to see people wearing masks. And as of Chinese New Year, when it was announced there was a, um, a local outbreak in Hong Kong that cases have been found here, you will see in Hong Kong, in mainland China, that about 99% of the population wear masks. And in fact, last week, it was made mandatory to wear masks in all uh, public transport. And as of today, it is now mandatory in Hong Kong to wear masks in all public indoor spaces. Um, now, wearing masks is also very common in Singapore and in China. And I do believe that that's a big reason that we've kept our cases quite low. Bringing it back to the, the office experience, well, what do we do about masks in the office? So during the COVID period, we have a rule with our offices, which is if you have any symptoms of, at all of illness in any way, please do not come to the office, right? Don't, don't take that risk on other people. And so um, what we'll see in the office is number one, Every building in Hong Kong or almost any in Hong Kong, Singapore and mainland China have a temperature check when you walk into the building. So anyone who has a temperature is screened out at that point. Uh, people will wear masks all the way until they get to the office. And then depending on the size of the office, they may or may not wear a mask inside the office. Uh, in, our, in our Hong Kong office where I'm situated, people will met, wear masks, some people all day long and other people when they enter the office, they take their mask off. Um, now, during, during the last, oh gosh, six months, I just can't believe it's six months, we've had four different scenarios. So we've had the compulsory uh, work at home scenario. And so that's where we started off immediately at Chinese New Year. So from, from February, we all moved to work at home. Now, remember that we left the office for Chinese New Year break. Then there was an outbreak and we just didn't return to the office, right? So there was a period of time, I think it was about six weeks, where we worked from home. After that, we had an option for our team um, of optional work from home. So we went back to the office, but team members could optionally work from home if they wanted to. Now, in that case, it could be because schools were closed and people had to look after their kids, or that someone had um, lived in, or lives in a household whereby they don't want to be bringing something home. We then had a scenario where it was optional work from home, i.e., sorry, optional work from office, i.e., um, everyone work at home unless you really find it difficult, in which case you're welcome to the work at the office, but we encourage you work to work from home. And we had that option last week and the week before, where there seemed to be a rise in number of cases, but we didn't yet know what it was about. So we encouraged everyone to work from home. But do remember in Hong Kong that people live in about 500 square feet with six to seven people in a house. And so working from home and, and especially for our millennials and Gen Zers, spending day and night with your parents isn't necessarily something they want to be doing. Um, and then of course there's the, 
compulsory work from home, which is where Hong Kong is at the moment with this current community outbreak, whereby we have locked the office and nobody is welcome to go into our office space. And so that's kind of the four different scenarios we've been working by. Um, now, thinking about uh, how do we manage team members in the two periods that we've gone back to the office. So just to clarify, we, went, we worked from home, then we worked from the office, then we worked from home, then we worked from the office, and now we're working from home. So, you know, we're, we're getting good at this now. But looking at the office, we have signage on our doors that says, wash your hands immediately. When a staff member walks through the door, they go straight to the sink before touching anything and wash their hands. Um, we've had periods of time when cases are higher where we haven't welcomed any outsiders into our office. So we've cleaned our offices ourselves. Uh, we've, we've made sure that there's no one coming from the outside into our communal space, which makes it a bit easier for our team to feel more comfortable. You know, the last few weeks we've been, or a few months, I should say, we've been in a very safe place in Hong Kong. We've actually had periods of time where there were no cases for up to three or four weeks in a row. Um, and so, yes, we let the guard down. Uh, and in that case, it was back to having meetings in the office and such. But we did ask people who were coming into our office space to wear a mask and to wash their hands the minute that they walk in the office. I do feel like I, I don't have kids myself, but I do feel like in the office, I, you know, that feeling of being a parent of have, have you washed your hands? Have you washed your hands? Um, a different, a different way of uh, uh, working in life, I think it is. And then wherever possible, we encourage our teams to have meetings online with outside parties rather than to attend meetings externally in person or have people coming to our offices. Another thing that I'd like to bring up is um, very relevant to, to colleagues that I've been speaking to from independent agencies around the world. So I'm a member of a number of independent agency organizations and from February onwards have been giving seminars and talks on how to manage your office space when nobody knew what to do. And one thing that I mentioned back in February is to remember about your airflow in your office. So Usually in an office block, if you're in a building, your airflow circulates from your office into other people's offices. So wherever possible, turn off communal air conditioning, get a fan in your office. I mean, throughout winter in, in Shanghai and Beijing, when people return to the office, we bought heaters for the office so that they didn't have to turn the central heating on and therefore reduce the airflow coming from external spaces. And, um, I got an email a couple of months ago from an agency in, in Italy that was on one of those calls who actually said that they followed that guideline and they were the only office in their building that didn't have a case of COVID when Italy first went down with COVID and that they put it down to those, the airflow and the use of masks. And they all laughed at me and they all did it. And then I got a nice bunch of flowers in the end saying, thank you. But just, you know, I'm, I'm not a doctor, I'm not an expert, but these are the things that that we do in our markets, and it does come from experience over the years. I think, you know, that's talking about the challenges in um, kind of the space itself. I think the other side of the challenges comes to how to work together. And so how have we done that? How do we keep people motivated? How do we keep communications flows? Um, how do we um, keep people engaged and, and make sure that they're okay? I think mental health is a big part of of this conversation too. Um, and what we've been doing through this time is we've had um, not only email groups for both internal email groups, but just for our teams working on an individual client, but also external email groups, as well as WhatsApp groups that are internal and WhatsApp groups that are external for each individual client. The reason for that is that the crisis management aspect of what we do and we're a PR-led uh, integrated agency, we do a lot of crisis at the moment. So um, being sure that our clients can contact us quickly and that we can have a very swift response um, is really essential in this time. And so, you know, we started just recently talking about how to get rid of the client WhatsApp groups. And thank God we didn't because of course, we need them again now. Um, but I do think that we are transitioning into a critical period of time whereby the number of hours that we allocate a client doesn't apply anymore. The tasks that were, you know, in your original service agreement with that client doesn't apply anymore. We're in this adaptive pivotal period whereby 
we have an understanding of what our commitment to our client is and what we need to pull off during this period and the tasks that we're doing and the hours that we're spending are starting to vary. Most of our clients are working extremely well with us to understand that and compensate us wherever they can or to bring it in-house when they understand that we've gone above and beyond. Um, so I think that the tools that we're using are really uh, an important aspect of how we communicate and how we get on. Um, I'd also like to just give a shout out to memes. Memes are everything, you know. There has to be humor. And any given day, that moment where you smile and you just have a laugh from a friend, it, it's sometimes the only moment that you have with a smile on your face in a day, right? Uh, and I think that that being able to still remember that we have colleagues who are still getting married, still having babies that, you know, have other big things happening in their life that aren't just COVID. How do we help to bring the, this is a bad saying to use, but bring the temperature down on the constant crisis, right? And rather focus on, you are allowed to have good moments in your day, humorous moments, fun moments, you're allowed to forget for a little while. Um, and I think overall, like that's, that's the key of how we've gotten through this is to remember that in our uh, agency families or our business families, we have good days and bad days. Moodiness has gone up, right? And it's okay to cry on a con call. It's fine. Everyone gets it, you know, just like it's okay for your cat or your child to join you. Um, and that humanness that's come into our everyday is for me, uh, one of the most amazing experiences that I've had in 2020. And I, I just feel like and really hope that whatever the next normal looks like, that we do bring that humanness along on the ride for, you know, with us. That's something that we don't let go of. Um, and on a last note, I think that my final tip would be really to trust. Trust your colleagues when they say they're working from home. Trust your colleagues when they say they're sick. Trust your clients when they say they've got it in hand or they don't, right? Um, it's really important at times like this to just really have trust with other people and make sure that uh, we're not undermining them, that we're acting in kindness, and that our first reaction is, I believe you, not something else. Um, yeah. So that, that's my, my little tip. So I'll pass it on now to Sarah. I've just got a couple of questions that have come in. Yes. One for you um, in particular, about practically about the temperature check. Yes. How that works with a high volume of people coming into the building. It's Sarah Griffiths um, who's asking this question. Um, uh, ha so how it works uh, and what happens if the building's shared with other companies? Absolutely. So I work in an office block in Hong Kong. We are, I don't know, 40 something floors. There's at least one office per floor. Um, in Asia, we have a uh, infrared system that checks our temperature when we walk into a building. So you're not using uh, a thermometer or anything like that. Um, so basically you walk past a screen as you do in an airport uh, in most of the buildings and they will catch anyone who has a temperature. What we do say to everyone is to take your temperature at home before mm. you leave the house. And if it's, if it's even slightly higher than it is on a normal basis, don't leave the house, right? Uh, we know that checking a temperature, that having a cough, these are the key things and, and the taste buds, right? So um, I had a chat with a doctor the other day because I uh, had a little bit of a cough and I have, I have um, a, a reoccurring sinus issue. But, you know, because of COVID, I phoned anyway and spoke to my doctor on the phone and she said, okay, put a lemon in your mouth if you can taste it, you're okay. I'm like, okay. I can still taste it, I'm good. So that's not doctor's advice, but that's just like, can you taste, do you have a temperature, do you have a cough? If so, don't leave the house. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Sarah. Um, hello, yes, and thank you as well for, for the invite. And I've already learned loads, so I'm really glad I'm, 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 really glad I'm here. So thank you, Kiri. Um, so a little bit about what's happened for Saatchi and Saatchi over the last few months, we went into lockdown on the 16th of March. So about a week ahead, of the government advice and I'm so so glad that we did um, and that week made a huge we know that week made a huge amount of difference because um, over the following week to 10 days there were a large number of our agency team who did display flu symptoms 
various degrees. And at the time, there wasn't a huge amount of testing in the, in, in the UK. So we didn't have any confirmed cases of COVID out of 250 employees, but there were some very serious symptoms being displayed. And I know that that week must have made a difference. If it would have been a week later, just how much worse it would have been amongst, amongst our crew. So yeah, we're, we're, we're four months in. There's been um, there's been highs and lows. Um, I know everyone on the on the call there is creativity hardwired into your organisation. So I'm I'm sure you're all feeling the same across those sort of four months of uh, of first very intense lockdown through to now a lot of remote working. We talked for years about can we move to a more agile way of working? Can we do something that helps parents do drop offs so that we don't have meetings starting at the wrong time? Or can we trust our younger talent? Uh, to work from home when they need to work from home. So I think there's been the massive upside is that yes, absolutely, all to, all to the above, we can we can absolutely accommodate accommodate agile working um, and working brilliantly from home. We did a survey a few weeks ago because we're about to move to pivoting into when and how we return to the building, and the positive sentiments about 95% positive sentiment to working from home. Really happy, loving it, really enjoying it. I get to have breakfast with my four-year-old every day. Like genuinely positive. Let's find ways of doing this moving forward. So a, a lot, a lot of plus sides from from the working from home. People feel like there's time to think. There's time to take a step back, to reflect, to plan, to 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 to, to um work to work through those sort of gnarly problems. Um, I think we're seeing amazing discipline around meetings meetings start on time and finish on time, which is unprecedented in, uh, in real world. So that's, that's been a, a huge upside. Um, Kiri, I loved your point about the humanity that has come through as a result of this, the connectivity, kids wandering into shots, actually a real respite. It's great when the kids join in. Um, and that's, we've worked it through, but that I think huge pluses for this weird enforced uh, working from home, um, situation but of course we've also experienced and having to navigate some 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 real downsides creativity there's nothing creativity needs stimulus and it needs energy and that, that it's hard to do on a zoom call it's hard to do a creative review and build off each other and bounce off each other because we try and fill the gaps and actually creativity sometimes needs a bit of silence and a bit of reflection and a bit of and we need to move things around walls don't we you know physically it's hard to do that on a on a, on a zoom so there are some things that have just, we've been flying on with greater production. We made three or four massive TV campaigns under lockdown, under proper lockdown, whether that was setting up a camera in Kevin Bacon's garden and walking away and then Kevin Bacon came out and he sat there and he filmed and he got directed by director on Zoom. Like, brilliant. Production has been incredible because with production, there's an end point and you just have to power through to that end point. Strategy similar, but it's that creative bit in the middle, which is much more organic and in and out where we have at times really struggled because we haven't been able to bounce with each other in the same way. We're filling the silences too quickly. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's been a, a, fun, a fundamentally a challenge, but we have, we've definitely got through it. I think the other sort of serious downsides is the pressure on working parents. I actually, I don't know how they've done it. And, and we've, we've, we've introduced Saatchi timeouts so a set time of the day, so at 11 to 12 and 3 to 4, you're not allowed to put meetings in the diary so that parents know there are, there are two hours in the day where they know they can do something with their kids. Or for our non-working parents, they can go for a run or they can clear their email so they're not working until 8 or 9 at night. So uh, those timeouts, and they are not perfect, but we are going to make a way to make sure that they work and make sure the discipline is there. With our clients as well, so expect to all our clients before we introduce it to say, will you support it? They're like, yes, we're going to support it and we're going to do it ourselves. So that formal timeout and acceptance that it's exhausting, this screen time is not good, it's not healthy, and a full stop for everyone, uh, we found it is really important. So working parents and timeout. So as I said, the survey we did 95%, this is really good. Can we keep doing it in some form? But there was definitely a very sobering 5% of response, which was like, I'm feeling very lonely. I feel disconnected. I feel more worried. I, I, I'm, I'm struggling. I feel worried about my job lots. But, and they're the things that we have to make sure that we're doubling down on because whatever happens, we're not going to quickly go back to being in the office as a totality. So what can we do to, to resolve those concerns and like just seeing someone write and feeling really lonely on a on an anonymous survey and knowing we have we have a responsibility to every individual that they stay as healthy as, as possible which obviously includes mental health so um 
mostly our, our agency are very happy with the uh, with the way lockdown is working but there's a few things that we definitely need to to navigate and in some ways navigate more that we are coming out of lockdown we potentially temporarily in the UK um, because we've opened up one of our campuses so I'm Saatchi is part of publicist groups a huge huge uh, um, comms organization uh, and they have um, created a campus at where our building is our office on Chancery Lane and anybody who works for publicist group can use that building and and in each agency's got like a, a mini section within it so we opened up the uh, the campus on the 1st of July the publicist group campus um, it, and it's of course that creates its own because you go from everyone working remotely to suddenly some people possibly in the in in the office. But um, so it's one campus as a booking system, so it's every very much on an individual need. So it might be you've got kids at home, you just need to get away from them. It might be because you're just desperate to use the printer. It might be because you're a creative, you just know it needs to get in a room with your partner and just get into it. So it's uh, it's done individually. It's a booking system. We have temperature checks when you arrive. Um, like almost like an iPad, iPad screen that you stand in front of, sanitizers everywhere. There's a one-way system to move through the building. Um, we don't use the lifts, and then we're lucky because it's only five floors. But of course, that's no. It's very hard to be more than a meter away in a lift. So that's one of the things that we're super, super aware of. Um, but at the, probably the biggest, the biggest challenge it creates when you open up the office again is most people don't want to go in. So then how do you, what's the cadence of meetings or how projects work so that no one feels obliged to go in? So we were very clear back in, sort of even back in April, May time, we said, we don't know what is happening with COVID-19 and this pandemic. And we, this was a, a group response and certainly supported by Saatchi. We said, nobody has to go back into the office until 2021, regardless of anything that's happening. So immediately it takes the pressure off everybody so whatever happens, this is about your safety and what works for you. So that's been good because you're taking away some of the uncertainty for people to say, look, it's your call. And then we're a small organization. I know Jennifer's about to talk, lots more employees, tricky, 250 people. There are ways to manage things on a project by project or even a meeting by meeting basis. So that's where we are now. A um, few, few bigger meetings have gone in. I think we've had one of our first big client meetings uh, in the boardroom, obviously with one meter spacing. So. Um, yeah, we're, we're definitely moving into hybrid, but with our agency in no rush to return. So other than really the connectivity, it's the social reasons are the, are the main reasons, I think. And then we're looking at potentially doing some smaller clusters so that people can spend time together without going into central London. One of our biggest challenges is the tube. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the last place I want any of our team to be going at the moment. So we're encouraging people to obviously walk or drive if they can or cycle or get a mainline train and then walk from one of the mainline stations. It's not never going to be more than a mile or two to the office. So, um, yeah, we're working through that at the moment. And um, yeah, safety, safety, 100 percent. That's what it's about. That, that's, that's what we're doubling down on and we'll continue to for the next six, 12 months. So there's been a couple of questions in for, you, for, for, for your part, Sarah, specifically yeah. around creativity. This is not a surprise mm -hmm. um, that these questions are coming in. How do you, as an incredibly creative advertising agency, how are you managing those downsides to not being together? Um, um, it'd be really interesting, like what techniques are you using to make keep everybody together and that creative spark? Yeah, I think it is about using, it's about using something like Zoom properly. There's it Zoom or Microsoft Teams. There's something about the UX of Zoom that allows us to sort of see each other better and, and control it better. So we do, we're, we use Zoom way more. Um, I think it's about encouraging people just to have time, but sometimes just hang out. You don't always have to have a killer objective at the end of each meeting. Sometimes it's just hanging out and bouncing ideas. And um, I think it's about reading the Zoom. That person's gone really quiet. Let's make sure there's a follow-up call. How are you feeling? So there's quite a few calls going in at five, six, seven at night. You like you end up just chewing the fat, but super important just to make sure um, people who are more reflective or introverted are still getting an opportunity to speak. Um, in truth, on the most practical level, I'm not sure we are always brilliant at it because there was a real sense of we're on it. Don't worry, clients, it's cool, nothing to worry about. We are still operating business as usual. Actually, having an honest conversation with clients, going it's really hard. This is the hard bit. Creative development is so hard. And can we just have another week? We're gonna need another week. And that, that, that's hard because we're trying to show, don't worry, you can rely on us, no worries here. But sometimes it's just having that conversation with the client saying, another week would be great. Um, or we're gonna show you stuff, probably not quite there yet, but we don't wanna go completely silent, but perhaps not being too heroic. 
in our client relationships has been quite important. You know, we've certainly well. found, and I'm sure you have, that our client relationships are, are really, have really grown. Yeah, really, really quite grown. Tight. Absolutely. We're really tight. And, uh, you know, it's not with all of them, most of them, you know, it's really, really improved. It's fantastic to see. Um, and we've also had a question here, which I think is really interesting from Caroline Holmes about um, what about the younger members who might find that really difficult to be at home? How are we making sure that they're not missing out? Final question to you, Sarah, then we'll move on to Jennifer. Yeah, in fact, it's one of the reasons when we were opened up again, and we've been open since the 1st of July, and I, and I have to approve everyone who goes in, so there's loads of layers of approval on that booking system. I was like, oh my God, I've written my whole day approving. It's been very low take up, only 24 people up 250, or 24 visits up 250. Um, but what we did think was we'd have more of the young members wanting to go in because the thing that we've been very worried about, like I get to sit in my lovely kitchen, the door's open, I see my garden. For a lot of our young and advertising, it's very near average age, but about 27, 28, they're working in bedrooms, sat on their beds. So we, it, we have got to be doing more over the next five to six months. This, what can we do to make them feel comfortable about going into work and or what can we do to make it more comfortable for them being at home working? Um, but that, that the, again, it comes back to that phone call that you can put in, just put the call into the quieter one. They're more likely to be a more junior person, make sure they're okay. Make the say, I know this sounds really silly as well, but there's the physical looking after, but there's also saying thank you has never been so important. And that, that, that was amazing. I don't know how you managed to crack that in a week under lockdown. So I think there's an element of practically how do we look after people, but also emotionally what we're doing to, to, to say we are grateful and we appreciate it because that does obviously carry all of us. Brilliant advice. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. So Jennifer, over to you. Hi. Um, good morning, afternoon, evening to everyone. Um, thanks so much for the opportunity to join you um, and talk with you about this really extraordinary time that we're all going through. I have to, before I even go any further, I just have to say I have so enjoyed hearing Kira and Sarah, and Sarah talk through these experiences. And just, you know, I was client side, I was at agency side for the first half of my career. And I got to tell you, I miss you guys. It was really fun just hearing you all talk about all of that. It's, it's, it is much different being client side and I've been client side now for a good, almost 15 years. And, um, it is, it is different. I work for a large, um, uh, manufacturer in the US. It's a ceilings and wall manufacturer, acoustical ceilings and walls. And we've got a number of plants and we have corporate offices, all told about 2,700 employees, I would say in the US, Canada and Latin America. And it is, um, it, it, it's different, but it's also very similar. We have, uh, we are seeing and, and experiencing many of the same things that you all are. We're in the US, we still remain um, in somewhat of a lockdown. Lockdown is an interesting term. We, we haven't really used that term here so much, um, but we are working from home and we continue to work from home. We have not gone back to the office in full force at all. And I don't think we know when that will happen. Um, right now, what we are planning for is um, we have opened our corporate offices in sort of a first phase where we allow people by request to go into our corporate offices, our manufacturing facilities, incidentally, we, we were considered essential. So our manufacturing facilities have continued to operate and we've employed all kinds of um, tactics, safety tactics to make sure that our people are safe, mask wearing, social distancing, plastic barriers, all kinds of reinventing how we cycle the manufacturing line, um, a number of things. But our corporate campus and our, our remote sales offices, we've still, for the most part, been working for, from home. And again, in this first phase, which we just started um, the 13th of this month, of our corporate office reopening in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, um, we have, we've, we've by request are allowing about 120 people or so over the next six weeks to go on to the campus to do some of the work that you all were talking about. It's a different, it's a different side of that work, but it's things like 
product development. We have a bunch of labs on campus, equipment and things for chemistry and um, science and um, understanding formulations and how can we develop products that are going to be more useful in this time of the pandemic. So there's a lot of those kinds of access to equipment and space and tools that our people need to be able to do some of their work. So we are allowing that, but anyone who can work from home, we are encouraging to continue to work from home. And we have not said that no one's going back to the office till 2021, but it's quite possible that that may come. I, I, that has been part of the, the discussion. And I agree with you, Sarah. I do think that that would sort of take, um, that would give people a little bit of relief just to understand what things are gonna be. That said, I've got some other things to sort of talk with you about um, that I think might be interesting because I am, we are in the building products industry and we are in the, we, we work a lot with architects and designers, the, build it, the, the building and construction industry. Um, thought it might be useful for you all to hear a little bit about what we're hearing about what people are considering um, as they are going back to work, how space, needs to perform differently or what things we need to take, to, take, to take into consideration about our spaces and our buildings as we're going back to work. How can we office better? How can we office better, safer, healthier? Can our spaces do more for us um, than simply just protect us from the elements? I mean, none of this, these are not new questions. I mean, the A and D community, and I, I use that term um, loosely, it's architect and design community. So if you hear me talk about the A and D community, that's what I that's what I mean. Um, they have been talking about this for a long time. It's what they taught that that these are things that they consider. That's part of their work. That's what they consider and philosophize about all of the time. It's just that now, it has become an immediate and real concern. Um, for all of us in the building products industry, for ourselves and for our customers and for our clients, we're all having these conversations. So there have been a number of studies um, that have talked, that, that, that are, are, have been pulled together from a number of different sources that I thought I'd talk a little bit about. Um, and I will say first too, that the great work from home experiment um, has gone pretty well too. We have found the same things that Sarah and Kira Kiri have found as well. In that, people people are doing people are doing their work. <laughs> they are responsible. They are showing up at meetings. I mean, I find, frankly, people are almost overdoing it just to show that they are super responsible and that they are willing to work hard from home. Um, so. Uh, you know, we have we have not had any trouble on that front. Um, and if anything, we have found that people are more productive and more committed um, than ever before, not the least of which is because we're all concerned. I think we're all concerned about our economies and our livelihoods and our jobs. We want to make sure that we can keep things going um, and contribute because we are seeing a lot of people that have been out of work. And, you know, it's it's a little scary. So everybody is really, I think, being very responsible about working. And the mechanics of work, the technology, is really performing pretty well. I mean, we're having, we're having great luck with technology. We have the occasional glitch, but we would have had that in the office too. It's no different than working from home. So all of that stuff is working really, really great. Um, however, getting back to the studies, we are seeing some pretty consistent themes about um, working from home and the idea of returning to the office. And the reality is people do like working from home. They just don't want to do it all the time. <laughs> they really don't. They want that flexibility between uh, that would allow some working from home and some working from the office. That really sort of ideal situation is, is what people are after for the most part. And the reasons, there are three big reasons that people, um, want to go back to the office. And the first one, and we've heard it here, is that they miss the people. They miss colleagues. They miss that collaboration, that, that opportunity to brainstorm. The in-person live interaction just cannot be replaced with a screen. It, it just can't. Um, and we are all learning that reality. Plus, we want to be around people besides just our families. Our families are driving us nuts. 
a little bit. I mean, we love them, but they're also driving us nuts. And so to get out in the world and be, and have that sort of, have a bigger world, I guess, is what we all want. And young people in particular, a lot of their social networks are connected to their work. And being isolated at home is tough. It's tough on them. We are absolutely seeing that. Um, second, and I thought this one was really, really good, and we're seeing this also pretty consistently, is that we also miss the space that comes with commercial buildings. I mean, uh, um, Vicki, I am looking at your space behind you right now, and that is a perfect example. I mean, look at me, I got books and pictures and stuff jammed. I'm in this little space so that my background looks good. I mean, we miss the space of commercial buildings. Um, the space that doesn't have all of our personal junk lying around. Um, we like our personal stuff, but just maybe not all of the time. The um, count is way down. I mean, like I'm walking about 200 steps a day at the moment. Like, yeah, <laughs> well, there's that too. <laughs> absolutely right. That's absolutely right. And, and you know what? There's no physical separation between life and work. There's no barriers anymore. So, you know, we all talked about working 24 seven before, but that has even become more real. I think to people because the computer is always right there and it's just 10 steps away from you at any given moment. So you're, you know, so we're seeing a lot of that, that demarcation line between, between work um, and personal life is just really, really blurred. And the third thing, and, and Sarah, you were talking about the tube and some other stuff, but the thing that people are missing is the commute. We use the commute for a lot of things. First of all, the first reason is it got us up and up and out. We, we got, going out of the house. We felt like we were making things happen. We were going forward. We were out, you know, tackling our day. And um, now we're just, you know, rolling out of bed and into a chair um, and checking our email. And there's just not, there's not decompression on either end, either before you go into work or before you come home. And so those are, those are some interesting, I, I think, findings from these. There, there are a, a number of other things, but these are three things that sort of surfaced more consistently um, across studies. So, you know, the big one across the world was connecting with people. People are missing people um, at the end of the day. So because of that, um, you know, as we're thinking, and as Armstrong is thinking about space, we are we are starting to consider what we have to do. I mean, we have a big campus in Leicester. We have about six, 15, 16, 17 buildings on our corporate campus. Um, we only have about 700 people there, but we actually, we do lease some space to other companies on, on this corporate campus. Regardless, we have we have a lot of buildings, but the buildings are not, perfect for returning to work. Um, we have, our offices are decent size, but not great. I mean, for most of our offices, you can't have more than two, maybe three people in there if you're six feet apart, six feet apart and you're backed into the corners. I mean, that's not great. Our meeting spaces too. I mean, we thought about even some of our largest meeting spaces. They're just not designed to accommodate people six feet apart. Um, so it's not really desirable. And I would suggest that a lot of offices are facing these similar situations. So as people, as we all think about going back to work and as we are seeing pe what people's concerns are about going back to work, the, one of the biggest ones is they want more space per person. Um, overall, um, they, the cube thing is a very difficult thing to manage. I mean, we can't be sandwiched and stacked cheek by jowl in these spaces anymore because there's just not enough air circulation. There's not enough space between people. Um, acoustics, and this is important for us, the acoustics will be very, very important because as you're having meetings, and either you have to be a part or you're talking through masks, you can't have a lot of ancillary noise happening because people just won't be able to hear each other very well. Cleaning, sanitizing, this is gonna be huge. I mean, that's just gonna have to be on steroids. More of it in more places. We're seeing this, these ideas, this idea of UV dis disinfecting. Um, that will probably influence design as well because we, we won't be able to have stuff lying about everywhere because you can't get to it. You can't clean it if you've, if you've got books and papers and all kinds of stuff stacked everywhere. 
So this idea of minimal design and really using technology for storage as much as possible, I think is going to be not just something that's a nice a nicety, it's going to be demanded because otherwise cleaning services or cleaning um, operations aren't going to be able to happen effectively. Um, automated stuff. So we've already installed things like uh, automated faucets, touchless uh, uh, faucets, and we're rethinking the bathrooms and how all of that's going to work. Um, coffee makers, coffee stations, uh, refrigerators, elevators, even to get into the office, making sure everything is like foot controlled or automated, you know, just with sensors so that you can, you know, enter and exit the buildings that way. These are all going to be things that we're going to have to really start thinking about. Kiri talked about good air ventilation. That is huge. Air ventilation, air circulation, making sure that that is available and that it is fresh air being pumped in, not just recirculated air. Um, making sure that we have windows that can open. So many office buildings in big, big cities don't have windows that can open. I mean, all of our, we're, we're sealed in. That's not great. So having access to fresh air is gonna be really, really important. Um, there is some talk, and I, would, I think this would be awesome, but, and you know, Amazon has already done it, but what hasn't Amazon already done? If there's anyone from Amazon on here, lucky you, you all have already, you've already taken care of all of this. Um, but green spaces indoors, having a lot of green space indoors um, or having better access to it outdoors, um, parks on corporate campuses or being able to, you know, go out, all of, all of that sort of access to nature, sunlight um, is going to be important. Safe traffic patterns. Um, I already talked about flexibility and, and I just want to make one comment on this trend thing. All of these things we're taking into consideration for our own health and safety, but we are, I think, trying to be very mindful of the fact that as we're doing this, we have to balance this with the impacts that we might have on the planet. Hopefully, some of these things are synerg synergistic, or most of these things can be synergistic, but our goal is to make sure that they are. So, you know, this, these are some of the things that we're talking about for ourselves and for our customers and for our clients. How can we contribute to this? How can we make products that will be able to support sort of a different way of thinking about spaces and buildings? Um, there is such an opportunity to rethink space altogether. I mean, there was talk, I remember initially a couple of months ago, there was a number of articles in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, all talking about the office is dead, nobody's going back to the office. And our CEO was emphatic. He was like, yeah, no, I don't believe that for a second. He said, human beings are social. He's like, we can't operate through a screen indefinitely. That is simply not realistic to think that we are going to all be sequestered in our homes for the rest of our lives. It's just never gonna happen. And he's right. I mean, we are seeing that um, pan out. People are rightfully concerned and they do worry for their health and safety and we have to be mindful of that but they also want, they want, they want us all to figure out a way that we can be together again. So um, we are, um, we are actually, we've hired Gensler Architects. I, many of you may have heard of them. They're a huge global architecture firm. Um, and they are going to be helping us redesign our campus to be a model for um, what great, space redesign can be in light of the pandemic, but also just for people and how we can operate, how we can thrive better and how our buildings can be partners with us in that. Because we spend 90%, this is a fact, this is, this is a statistic out there. Many of you may have heard it, some of you may not. We spend 90% of our time in buildings, inside. So we have a renewed opportunity to make those spaces work for us in a really powerful way. And the pandemic, I wish it wouldn't have taken a pandemic to do it, but I think the pandemic is really inciting us to think differently about how we can, we can really make that happen and make our spaces be more comfortable for us, safer for us, healthier for us going forward. So that's what I've got. Um, I hope that that was I hope that was helpful um, for you. And I again, I really appreciate the opportunity to to talk with all of you. It was it was fun. Really and I'm, I'm going to questions.
Yeah, it's really helpful. And we've had a couple of questions in and really looking forward, Jennifer, to seeing how your organisation really, you know, keep us, keep, keep in touch. Let us know how you're developing your space. I think it's really super interesting to understand that. Um, a couple of questions you talked about. Um, Sarah talked about a full stop at the end of the day. Uh, we all talked about, oh my God, how do we get between one and the other? Emma sent a question in saying, um, what's the demarcation line? My question to you is, uh, how do you make it, you know, keep it clean? How do you make the difference between your office day and your relaxing time? I don't mind who goes first. I'm not, so <laughs> I can't answer yeah. that question. I'm absolutely terrible at it. Someone you described it. It's not, it's not working from home, it's living at work. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. It's so yeah, hard. I've really focused, sorry, sorry. I've really focused on a morning routine. So that idea of setting the alarm clock, getting out of bed at the time I always do, going through what I always would as if I was going to leave the office, minus the doing the hair and makeup, um, you know, but going through those stages so that when I do sit down at my, at my desk, all I've not really done is commute, right? And that I, you know, I'm at my desk and doing the routine I would usually do in the morning. Um, and then, you know, I work a lot within a, a crisis PR. And one of the areas of issues in crisis is that, you know, one of the golden rules is it always happens after hours, right? Don't you find that? But anyway, so, so that means that my evenings do often become later than, than otherwise. Um, but on the whole, you know, our office hours are 9.30 to 6.30. On the whole, by about 7, I've shut my computer down. I've, I've turned it off. Um, I'm having dinner and I'm thinking about the next thing, which often includes an eight o'clock conference call or something, because of course that's when Europe and the US works up. But you know, I do have that moment for, <laughs> for dinner and, and such. And also just pre-scheduling, as I, as I used to when I went to the office, pre-scheduling when I'm getting my exercise. Because mm -hmm. sitting on my ass all day doesn't do my head any good. And you know, never mind that I've got what you call COVID thighs. Yeah, it's a thing. Um, but minus the COVID thighs, it's I've actually... Had that. I've had that it's, forever. It's, <laughs> it's actually the mental health issue of you have to at least, you know, even if you're, you're not walking to the, you know, to the transport to go to work and all those steps that you take, you usually move your body. So what are you doing instead? So I'm focusing on perhaps making my um, uh, commute time meditation time, right? thinking about what stretches I need to do in the morning, the middle of the day and in the afternoon that isn't just standing up from my chair and sitting on the couch, you know? So those little things. Um, I've got a, a, a friend who hates to exercise alone. So we've been Zoom, Zoom stretching together, which really what it is, Amazing. is a good old natter with a friend while pretending to stretch. But actually <laughs> half an hour has passed and you've actually done some stretching. Do you know what I mean? Like, so it's just those silly things that that have come up, but I do think that routine has been critical for my mental health. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, I have allowed that demarcation line to blur a lot, but also to my advantage a little bit. If I haven't made it so much that, I, I've kind of almost done the opposite of you, Kiri. And I think the, the thing is, is you, you do what works for you, right? So we're, we're all going to be dealing with this a little bit different. And I think what I have allowed myself to do is if I see a window of time, and I'll tell you, in the last two weeks, it has not happened very often, but it did happen maybe a month or so ago. There were a couple of weeks in there, oddly. It was great though, where I would see a window of time in my calendar that was like three hours where I didn't have any meetings. And I left my house and I went out to a local, we have a couple of local nature preserves and I just went hiking for an hour. I took some extra time. I mean, it was, it was maybe two hours I was gone, but I just went and did it. Yeah. And, but did, and, and, and if I needed to, I might work an extra two hours on the other end of the day, maybe, but if I didn't, I didn't. Um, I think I'm just sort of going with what is, required and not necessarily worrying about what past practices has dictated. So 
yes, you, you were expected, many of us were expected to at least show our faces at the office, um, you know, fairly frequently. And our hours were, oh yeah, you know, they were in there between eight and six or eight and seven, whatever. You had to be in there at some point, right? And people expected those to be sort of working hours. We all worked outside of those. But I think the thing is, can we flex? Is the blurring of the lines all that bad? I don't know. I don't know. But I am finding that I am allowing myself to work more fluidly, I guess might be the answer, and live more fluidly in the course of my day. I don't know how long this, how well this is going to ultimately work. We've only been doing this for what? five or six months. It feels like forever, but it's really, I don't know if it's sustainable or not, but it's kind of what I'm doing. And I, I you know, I'm just, I, I'm letting, I'm working when I need to work and I'm living my life when I need to live my life. So um, with that in mind, I think some of you have got sort of different points of view. And there's been a question that, that, that came in um, before talking about, do we think, quick vote and then I'll close. Do we think that things will ever be the same again? Will we really go back to a nine to five or nine to six thirty or? Oh, the new normal, the next normal, the everything else. I think it's um, it's going to be surprising by twenty twenty two or whatever date it is that we've all been vaccinated twice and and whatnot. That we're going to forget that this two and a half year period that we lived through ever existed. And there'll be things, you know, just like SARS. This is just a curry take on life, right? But there are things that I think that will remain with us just like SARS when, you know, before SARS in Asia, it, our cities were a lot dirtier. After SARS, people wore masks, communal spaces were washed every two hours with disinfectants. Um, like all of these things happened. Um, that was a mass change from before, but actually your norm, my normal day to day was just about the same. Um, and, and I do think that like, let's say we're going to be like 90% the same, right? And 10% is going to change. That would be my take. Yeah, I think that's probably, that's probably fair. I don't think it's going to be the same. And I also think some of the things that will be different will just flow in and start to feel so normal, we won't even think of it as being different anymore. That kind of supports what you were what you were saying, Kiri. There, I think, I, I think it's not going to be the same, but it wouldn't have been the same anyway. <laughs> I mean, yeah. we have all we have all we change. Things are changing all the time. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I think I agree. It, will, um, it won't change as fundamentally as we are being at the moment. I think the shoulders of the day will change. Sort of that mm -hmm. hard nine start and the hard six finishes. I can't see us all slamming into crowded tubes ever again, but that's because our, we, have, we work in an agency where we can control that te tempo and cadence. It'd be different if you work in a bank and the bank has to open at nine still, or you work in a shop. So I think we're, we're lucky in that we can control our timetable to a degree. Yeah, I agree. Um, and with that, I'm afraid I've got to close and that hour has gone really, really quickly. Um, yeah, yeah. I, Honestly, it's been, it's been so fascinating. Thank you all so much for coming um, on the call. We've heard about uh, Kiri doing the okie cokey in and out of the office, um, <laughs> the importance of memes and being human, uh, creativity and trust and flexibility. Uh, we've also heard about Kevin Bacon's garden, but I wish I'd heard a little Amazing. bit more about that. So feeling a little bit shortchanged. Um, and I think most of all that's come from all three of you, we've really heard about the um, art and the importance of saying thank you to everybody all the time. So with that, I'd like to say a big thank you to you. And um, I hope to see all of you ladies soon. Keep us all up to date with how you're getting on um, with the office and I'll do the same. Corey. Thank you. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank, thank, you. thank you so much. And, and just to reiterate, thank you, Jennifer, Kiri, Sarah. Um, that was an enormously insightful and really appreciate you all taking your time out of 